Hi, I'm Gwen Blake, and today I'm hoping that I'm going to be a very smug butt. I'm going to show you how to make a bunt in the Thermomix. The Thermomix is an absolutely awesome kitchen machine, and it's one of the favorite things that I have in my life because it is all about efficiency. Um, so the first step that I'm going to do in order to make a bunt is I'm going to search for bunt on this. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural Chat 10 Book Club. I want to welcome you. I want to thank the traditional owners of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose lands we come to you from tonight. Nina, Hi. welcome. It's so thank fantastic to have you here. We've got people slowly joining us, so I'm going to save all the really juicy stuff for a couple of minutes. I can start seeing faces popping up. This is all, you know, a bit of an experiment, so bear with us. Um, we've had a couple of, you know, technical, um, what would you say, Nina? Not hiccups. Um... No, just sort of little... Um... I don't know what you call it. <laughs> well, I'd say they were challenges, actually, but we've had fun with them and hopefully you can hear us and you've got us all sorted. Hey, um, I am on trainer wheels tonight. I can't believe, quite frankly, that Lee and Annabelle have let me loose with this fabulous book author. And for the next hour, we're going to be having a bit of a chat. When I say trainer wheels, the bosses are still in the room. So I just want to have a little hello from each of them. Lee, are you there? I am. Oops, we've muted. Are you unmuted? Yeah. Hi. Unmute. Am I unmuted? Good. You're unmuted. Um, are you wearing pajamas? <laughs> no, I've got just a wrap on and, and pajamas under. Um uh Yes, apologies that for sort of the technical hiccups for our first go. We're just trying to sort it out. But anyway, we're very excited to be hosting Book Club tonight. So thank you very much for everyone for joining in and just get your questions sorted because Lisa's going to take heaps later. And what about you, Annabelle? Are you sitting there as well or are you busy in the kitchen doing something? <clears throat> no, no, I'm in my bedroom. I've selected a clear bit of wall and I have sort of day clothes up the top, but on the bottom I'm wearing trackies and Uggs. So I am very comfortable. I have a glass of wine and I've just come home from a really big demanding shoot. And so I'm so looking forward to somebody else doing the interview and doing all the hard stuff so that I can then chime in and like, you know, pick off some low hanging fruit at the end. Um, but mainly I'm just so thrilled to meet Nina because I've never met her before. And all that I know about Nina is picking up her manuscript and reading it and just thinking, OMG, this is an incredibly mature piece of writing. And so I 
cannot think of anything more pleasurable in the hour ahead than listening to um, a writer that I massively admire and a friend and colleague whose skills I implicitly trust talking about something in which I'm massively interested. Thank you very much. Well, well, here is the funny thing. I can now mute you. I, know you I can't can. believe that I've done that. <laughs> mute Annabelle Crab. <laughs> mute Lee Sales. <laughs> hey, so I am going to chat to Nina just um, probably for about 15 minutes or so. And then I know that everyone will be bursting with questions. And so you can start them coming in at any time and we'll then start going to them. So really looking forward to this. Before we dive into it, though, we've got a message from... Gwen. Hi, chatters. Um, as you know, the good people at Thermo Mix have run a special Chat 10 competition, which you entered when you registered for tonight. And one lucky chatter will become the proud new owner of my very favorite multifunctioning Thermo Mix kitchen machine. So Thermo Mix themselves are going to contact the winner of the competition by email um, after tonight's event. And we'll also be announcing it in the Facebook group. So, so keep an eye out there and have a wonderful evening with Lisa and Nina. Okay. Whew. I'll put a photo on the Chat 10 Facebook page later of what we're seeing and the efforts that we're going into to make to bring this to you. But let's get underway because it's all about Nina Wan and her fabulous book, The Albatross. Um, I've read it a couple of times now, and this is a book club, not an author chat. So we are going to have spoilers tonight, right? Because if you go to a book club, you are going to talk about everything to do with the book, including how it ends. So if you haven't got to the end, well, I'm sorry for you. You might need to mute us at various times. I might try and give you a warning, but it is the most beautiful book about a 36-year-old woman who called Primrose, of course, whose marriage is struggling. Um, she is struggling, and yet she finds peace in a rundown suburban golf course called Whistles. And the title comes from one of the rarest things in golf, two shots on a par five. The albatross is something that is deliberate and thoughtful, and so is Nina. I've had a coffee oh. with her. We've had we've caught up. She is a fun woman. I'm so thrilled. How are you feeling, by the way, tonight? I'm feeling well. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like I told you before, it's my very first book club. So uh, you've never no been pressure. a member. You've never been a member <laughs> no, of a book I've club. I've never been a member of a book club because I'm I'm just so slow, such a slow reader that I I, I just cannot ever commit to finishing a book on time um so yeah so this is going to be interesting <laughs> uh, hey um so how did you spend the day by the way well I was trying to sort of uh, stay relaxed <laughs> so I did watch a few episodes of Selling Sunset to you know just to kind of uh is that stay your guilty kind of, pleasure it, it is and um I, I don't know sometimes I just like to watch something that I, I mean I'm I'm a real lover of real estate to, to start with. But then if you pair that with, you know, high heels and uh, um, lovely skimpy dresses, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cocktail that you can't really resist. <laughs> hey, um, you've got two fabulous children, Katie, who's 11, and Eric, who's eight. Um, are they watching us at the moment? Do we need to say a little hello to them? Uh, yes, we could say a little hi, do a little uh, wave. Although I feel like these days they're probably more interested in watching uh, for example, Minecraft videos on YouTube or Babysitter's Club rather than uh, <laughs> tuning into mum's book talk. Um, so, yeah, so here's a wave just in case they're there. Okay. Well, let's dive into the book. I'm going to ask a really basic question. Forgive me if it seems like the silliest question out there. Are you Primrose? I think there are echoes of myself in Primrose and you know the book starts with Primrose uh, on a golf course and, I, and actually Primrose came to me while I myself was on a golf course and it was um, a dilapidated swampy 
little place with a drainage canal running through um, the middle of it. And uh, I was there at a really rough time in my life. And my husband actually suggested that um, I should take up golf as a way of kind of, uh, I don't know, re relaxing myself or just kind of digging myself out of the hole that I was in. And so, so I, I found it a profoundly meditative experience. And I thought to myself, what, what, is it possible to write a novel that begins on a golf course and in fact ends on a golf course as well? I don't think it has ever really been done. <laughs> there's not a lot of golf course stories. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think there's an Agatha Christie novel about a murder on a golf course, perhaps. Um, but, you know, I, I, I did just feel like there's, there's a poetry in golf that sometimes, you know, people kind of miss and it's underexplored in literature although certain writers like John Updike for instance have written very eloquently about it in in essays and so on and so so that was kind of a challenge that, that I set myself is to open with this scene of a woman who takes an unplanned detour into a golf course and um see see where that takes us yeah um, do you play golf Still? uh I, I don't play anymore. I And in fact, uh, back in 2018, which was when I found myself on that golf course, I, the discovery that I made was that I'm a terrible, just absolutely but terrible so golfer. Primrose. Yeah, and so is Primrose. And so, you know, I, I think in so far as this is a book about golf, it's about just a woman playing golf very, very badly. And, and, and somehow... Um, finding a path to who she is and who she wants through playing golf really really badly <laughs> so when so that sounds like it's fairly autobiographical but mm. where did you then start pulling yeah. away and creating primrose another character yeah i mean like almost immediately i mean uh probably from about chapter 2 or so it just started uh my imagination just started running away from me. And in fact, when I first sort of started writing, I thought maybe this could be a kind of semi-memoir. And that was what I thought it might turn into. But in fact, um, there were so many other interesting ideas in my head that I just, I, I couldn't stick to, um, you know, the facts. <laughs> So when we look at your, hus uh, your husband, Primrose's husband in the book, mm -hmm. Adrian, and we look at Peter as well. Mm -hmm. um, who, do you have those people in your life as well? Yeah. Um, actually, there are lots of sprinkles of my husband. I mean, you know, one wouldn't like to give one's husband too much credit. Hello, William. <laughs> Hi, William. <laughs> um, you know, I can just imagine future arguments that we have and, you know, he'll just always be pulling out the line. But I gave you yeah. Adrian <laughs> and Peter. Uh, but and then he'll be pointing to the live stream of yeah. Chat 10 Book Club exactly. that will always yes, be there. there. <laughs> yes. Um, but, but no, uh, um, they, yes. Yeah. So those characters did have sprinkles of William, although they, I would say that they're, they're, they're about 95% made up, obviously. Uh, so uh, Adrian, there's, there's echoes of William because William was actually very ill several years ago and, um, uh, and, and he in sort of, I, I think he was, I think he found me too gloomy to be around, even for him in that, at that time, like he was sort of dealing with his own issues, but he could see that I was really struggling and that's, that's, at that, the point at which he made that suggestion about playing golf. Um, and so, so that's sort of like the Adrian part. But then Peter um, has echoes of William because we did go to the same high school together and we were, we were just friends. So there was no sort of a romantic connection then. But it was that kind of history about the high school that sparked the character of Peter. Oh, so um, William is <laughs> Peter and Adrian in, in a way. Yeah, like in a very minor way, like in a very diluted way, <laughs> I would say. 
um, because I, you know, I, I, f- I feel like I'm embarrassing you <laughs> by telling you this. It's a very small group of 2,000 yes. people that we're chatting to here, yeah. Nina. It's fine. <laughs> and You'll never are, know. You know. And there are lots of Williams in the world, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's fine. But, uh, but speaking of the character of um, Peter, you know, Peter, if there was one character that single-handedly changed the course of Primrose's story, it's Peter because actually Peter didn't exist until I was about, 13 chapters into the first draft and this is a point where they go off into the holiday house in Flinders and I hit a wall I I had really bad terrible writer's block and uh one day suddenly occurred to me why don't I put uh, a high school boyfriend across the street and uh, and maybe you know that forces Primrose to sort of examine re-examine long buried feelings or or, or what have you. And so that was the point at which Peter actually appeared. And prior to that point, Peter was um, uh, not called Peter. There was a neighbour across the street called Brian who was married to Louisa. And Brian it was a bit older and Brian grew orchids in the front yard and he would, like, hiss at people when they walked past the house. <laughs> so Brian was not very sexy. And so Brian had to go. And Peter moved in. And, and so, and that's that's how Peter kind of materialized. Oh. <laughs> hey, you know, I just want to say um, we've had some amazing um, people gathering and joining us, including someone from Cornwall in the UK. Oh. So this is now an international book club. We've just Great. we've just totally taken it up a notch yeah. here. <laughs> and also people who wanted to let you know that it's their first book club too. Oh. So they haven't been in a book club before. Oh, well, that makes me feel a lot more relaxed. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So thank um, you for sharing that. What about Harriet? Where? Who is Harriet? This yeah, is, and yeah. I mean, you know, if, if for some people they haven't got through the book yet, of course, Harriet is the, I don't know, how old is she? She struck me as yeah, old. but she's, she's old. She's sort of pushing 80. It's never really kind of uh, specified, mm. but she is elderly. Uh and and, and she's say mature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she is uh, not unlike many women that you might find on the golf course. See, golf is one of those things that you can like literally play forever. So, you know, um, so she's not she's not based on anyone in particular, but she's got sort of, again, echoes of certain people that I might have uh, watched from afar on the golf course. And Harriet is. Um, uh I think Harriet is interesting because you know Primrose is kind of a very restrained narrator of her own story right Mm. like she doesn't actually uh explain things all that clearly she's restrained in so many ways yes she sort of just gets to the point of saying something but she doesn't say it. But this is why she, Adrian gets frustrated yes, with her because and, she doesn't express her yes, feelings. And in fact, lots of characters in the book, you know, get really frustrated with her and they sort of like want to prod her, like to see if she's still still got a pulse kind of thing. <laughs> um, and and Harriet is one of those people, but like Harriet really kind of goes out of her way to to try and get some sort of reaction um out of Primrose. And that results in um some fairly humorous situations like where you know she's making primrose do do all these drills before they go on the course um but it it also comes from a I think it also comes from a place where she just she really um even though she doesn't know much about primrose's story she's really trying to help her get somewhere (laughs) yeah well interesting because there's a few chatters out there who are already messaging in Mm. um kate solly pam capstick samantha ashen hello to all of you all of you Mm. really love harriet Mm. so do you think she was i mean of all the characters that people could um identify with or empathize with Mm. was harriet someone that people connected with have you found that yeah, I, I've had a lot of people say, and not just Harriet, but Jonathan as well is another one, that people just found them so enjoyable to to, to read about that sort of uh, could really connect with them. And I think it's, um, I really had a lot of fun writing Harriet uh, because, you know, as an author, I think you tend to, like, you tend to sort of helicopter 
hover over the main characters. Like you get really kind of quite domineering over your main characters, right? But you're a little bit more relaxed with the minor ones. And so that as a result, you 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 start to have this much more kind of like quite dynamic relationship with them. It's almost like this, there's this real person. You go, oh, you know, Harriet, so like you're the movie director and Harriet said this woman playing Harriet. You go, so Harriet, what would you like to do now? You know, like, <laughs> would you like to see Primrose end up in the mud? You know, like, and <laughs> and so it was, it was great fun writing the mar- minor characters in a way that it wasn't with the main characters. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what about Louisa? Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Louisa. I could live without her. Yes. So I mean, I loved her in the book, but it's like if yes. she was my neighbour and trying to be my friend, <laughs> yeah. I would be Primrose, not wanting her in the garage yes. with me. Yes. And um, I, I actually am really good friends uh, oh, no. with a neighbour across the street called Suze. Hi, Suze, if you're watching. And I'm still having trouble convincing her that I haven't, based in Louisa on her <laughs> but um yeah no Louisa is Louisa is out there I don't I, I mean I don't know how she came into my uh, my head I, I wonder if uh, maybe one of the ladies on Selling Sunset inspired me or something uh, we'll stick with that story hey yeah. eh? yeah. just to make sure yeah. Sue stays happy yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sue, it's not you it's yes. not you um, but the thing with the characters in the book is that all of them are flawed. So it's not just mm. Louisa. All of them are flawed in their own way, but all of them um, are like a little bit endearing in their own way, so with the exception of Terence, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, so Louisa is, you know, I think there's more to her Terrence than... Terence is the awful um, brother-in-law. brother-in-law just, yes. Yeah, for, yes. the, for people who might have read it ages ago, I had to read it again, actually, <laughs> which I was not a chore because mm. it was so enjoyable and I picked up things that I hadn't picked up right. the first time <laughs> round. So, yeah, we can all That's agree what... that we despise Terrence. Yes, yes. Um, the relationship with Primrose's dad mm. uh, and it really develops towards the end when he um, is attacked and it's mm. a racist attack. Mm. What was going into your thinking about writing that and what was the message that you were wanting to put out there? Because yeah. I do want to talk to you about about race yeah. in the book. So it's interesting because I didn't set out to write a book about racism at all and uh, uh, but I happened to be writing the book, the first draft in 2020. And I think it was in October that year that Senator Erica Betts got up in front of a Senate committee hearing and sort of singled out the three Chinese people in attendance and asked them to denounce the Communist Party. And so that was a real moment for me because I, I like I felt like that was almost a bit nightmarish in that you know you could maybe are we moving towards a world in which you could assume that someone is like an enemy of the state just because they look Chinese uh, unless they specifically prove themselves otherwise Uh, and that that was the point at which I I did think to to myself that I, I think I probably should work some of that in and I even, but, but, but even as I was writing, I was very hesitant to, to write about the racism Why? angle. Um, I think, you know, like when we first came to Australia, for instance, in the, in the early 90s, you know, we would sometimes encounter uh, racism on the street where, you know, like people would walk by and just yell out the window, go back to your own country. And I'm sanit- this is, that's a sanitized yeah. version of it. Um, and we never talked about it. Not my parents never talked about it with me. They never talked about it amongst themselves. And I think it's because we just always kind of assumed that that was part of the package of coming to this wonderful country. You know, it, it's it's a bit like going to a flight centre and this is sort of like a, a bit of a lighthearted example, but, you know, like you, you go in and you buy like a holiday package, which is wonderful, but there's one or two things that you don't want to do. Right, but you go. What well, the package is great, so you buy the package. Yeah, and you, 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 you don't do want the get, roller coaster yeah. at Disneyland, but you want <laughs> you to go want to Anaheim. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so I think all through my teenage years and my twenties and most of my thirties, probably, I just thought that um, I had to keep quiet if I was to want acceptance and if I was to want people to embrace me as an Australian. That I couldn't say anything really negative about the country and 
even now I struggle with it sometimes. I still feel like this urge to just keep my mouth shut sometimes. Oh, I'm you sorry. Know? And I'm so sorry you feel that way. Yeah. So um uh, but some of it did make it into the book mm. because um like I said, sometimes timing is everything. And it was 2020, the year of the China virus, the year where, you know, certain Asian people were uh, you know around the world were being attacked and so so that uh it just became kind of uh too much for me to stay quiet on and so that's that's how that went in the book so what I found interesting is that you also kind of delved into race issues between Primrose and Peter because yeah. Primrose was second generation right. mm-hmm. Peter was fifth uh, generation fifth, yes yeah and yes. so different yes that's right um and you know, Peter carries himself very differently uh, to Primrose. So confident. Yeah, confident and assured. And I think in Peter lies a kind of dream that that's what you can be. And in some ways I myself probably aspire to being like Peter in that I want to get to a point or certainly want wish that my children could get to a point where they don't have to look at, themselves uh sort of as part of a racial category they could just look at themselves as decent human beings and that will be enough Mm. and so Peter is kind of like a bit of a shining light of hope that maybe after five generations like like what Primrose's father says in the book that this is what life can be like in one in a hundred years in this country and so um yeah so it's a sort of an aspirational dream Mm. I guess (laughs) Um, can I just say these couches are very comfortable. They're so much more comfortable than the news breakfast couch. <laughs> I think I might yeah. take one back home <laughs> with me tonight. Or you can just leave here. <laughs> hey, now listen, <laughs> I may do that. <laughs> um, we're going to start taking some questions from the audience. Uh, my final question, oh, hang on, before we do that, though, I promised Lee and Annabelle that they could get the first mm-hmm. question each. So Lee and Annabelle, prepare yourself and hold tight for a second because I have one last question and it is the spoiler, spoiler, spoiler Mm. alert. Um, What happens in the end? Because I Mm. feel like it's really up in the air. Does Primrose go with Peter or this whole line about, (laughs) well, one thing's for sure, I'm not going to be living across the street from you. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. (laughs) She could be nothing. Yeah, so... uh the first thing to say is that like the beauty of having a book published is that uh you know people can interpret it however they want and that and that's that's totally fine that's the beauty of it um but I, you know my my from my point of view i i was somewhat surprised by how ambiguous some people uh found the ending <laughs> because in my mind uh she is saying perhaps in the strongest term that she can say, given all the surrounding circumstances of her life, that she wants to try and make it work with Peter. <laughs> uh, you know, oh. so um, the the very end is that, you know, she gets up and she takes him by the hand, right? It's not, it's a very active thing for, for someone like Primrose to do. In fact, she probably doesn't do much of that throughout the whole book, but she takes him by the hand and she says, um, we will have to figure it out. She doesn't say, I will have to figure it out. She says, we will have to figure it out. And, you know, like the albatross is, um, in, like it's an intensely romantic story, but in some ways it's also a cautionary tale because it, possibly they could have walked into the sunset together when they were teenagers but they didn't do that so 20 years on they have all this baggage she has a child she has a husband and all signs are that they were once happy if they're not no longer happy now and and so she she she's basically saying in the firmest way given that she's not going to just pack up and leave her child with her husband or whatever given given all the surrounding circumstances that 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 she wants to try and make it work with Peter but you know I I'm I'm open to I'm happy to for other people to interpret it in other oh, ways they'll be like telling I, us they'll yeah. be they'll be writing <laughs> in right now as you're talking yeah. um okay Lee let's go to you 
Um, well, there's lots of commentary now about how people are interpreting the ending. And, and one of the things I think people like is that they could interpret the ending as they wanted to. Just um, a quick point, if you do want to make a comment or ask a question, um, just letting you know, it's from the chat button at the bottom of the screen on, on Zoom, so you can do that. Um, I just wanted to also say it's so great to be able to see faces of names that I see in the group all the time. That's just I've been scrolling along the top line going, oh, my God, there's Liz Farley. That's what she looks like. And so all of that kind of stuff. Um, can I just quickly point out as well that um, Lisa Miller saying that she's read this book twice is why Lisa Miller is such a brilliant journalist and why the person we wanted to do this book club because, of course, she's read the book twice because she prepares everything to the nth degree and puts in so much effort. She went and had a coffee with Nina. She read the book twice. Such a Lisa Miller um, way to do it. So thank you, Lisa, for doing such a good job. Um, Nina, I wanted to ask you, because you used to be a journalist at the Australian Financial Review, how hard did you find it to break out of the discipline of needing facts and the structure of reality um, to dictate the structure of the story and just be able to be making up whatever you liked? Yeah, um, it was actually very uh, liberating to be able to do that. Um, so journalism for me, I, I had a great time at the AFR, but I always think of those journalism years as a, like kind of a little bit of a detour to get me to finally writing uh, that novel, you know, I, I think the novel is what I always wanted to write. Like even as a small child, I wanted to write a novel um, and I call it an affliction because it's actually a really an annoying urge to have because it gets in the way of you living other parts of your life um, a lot of times. But my my father, who was a very practical person, always said to me, um, you know, writing a novel is not going to put food on the table. So please go and do a law degree. <laughs> at uni. And so that's what I did. And then uh, in my 20s, I realized that there was kind of some kind of middle ground where I could get paid for writing. And that was journalism. And so that's how I kind of ended up in journalism. And, and, and you're right in saying that, you know, writing uh, news is very, very different. Like it's very top heavy and the editor would always say, you know, you got to throw everything you've got at the top two paragraphs because the assumption is people might not not keep reading um, any any more beyond that. Um, so so that was that was journalism and but th there's nothing quite that feels quite so liberating as writing fiction. Mm -hmm. Your mind can go anywhere it wants to and it's a very cathartic experience I think by the time I sat down to write the albatross I had a lifetime of things that I perhaps just subconsciously wanted to say that kind of just poured poured themselves onto onto the page so there's nothing there's nothing quite like it it's it's extremely frustrating at times like because you feel like you're lurching from one writer's block to the next you know it's incredibly hard work um, but, uh, but, but it's also, um, a great source of joy. Annabelle. Thanks, Lisa. Um, well, first of all, I'm just thrilled to hear that there is a pathway to being a great novelist via the Australian Financial Review. Like, I mean, that gives us a great deal of <laughs> comfort. Those of us who have worked for a long time as journalists and, you know, I love the, I love writing, you know, writing a, a sentence with which I'm super happy is one of the most exciting things that I can ever do in any given day. But I feel really nervous about the idea of making things up and um, jumping the tram tracks of reality. One of the things that I really just love about Primrose, Nina, um, and I congratulate you for that character, um, regardless of what percentage of you she is um, because she's kind of, she's unpredictable, she's funny, she's fallible, she doesn't really conform to any stereotype whatsoever and she is constantly surprising in her responses to things and um, I think she's like a genuinely brilliant character. Like she's sort of, 
Reminds me a question there from the floor. Do you have a question there from the floor? I'm happy to just just say, like, keep listening to this praise. (laughs) This is like every writer's festival, Annabelle. (laughs) Oh, Lisey, it's so harsh. She reminds me a bit of Eva Campbell Berry, who's one of my favourite literary characters, um, written by the late great um, Frank Morehouse in her fallibility and her um, indomitability and her originality. And here's my question. So, Nina, you wrote this book and it won an unpublished manuscript prize in Victoria. It was, and uh, so, yeah, so it was shortlisted for the um, Victorian Premier's Literary Award in the unpublished unpublished manuscript category all right sorry I promoted you I thought you won that thing but like (laughs) when you like when you get a sense of people having read it and liked it does it change your opinion of the work because when I write something I always hate it and then if one person goes oh that's great I go actually that is okay do you feel like that about your writing yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there's definitely, uh, you definitely look for sources sources of, of validation. So like, because it's when you write your first novel, you can't just kind of give a few chapters to a publisher and go, what do you think, right? So then the only person you can give it to is your husband. And, and so I think William has probably read, you know, like 10 different versions of the first five chapters or something like that, um, before it became anything and his feedback was you know always extremely positive (laughs) uh, (laughs) to the point that you know it became a little bit like how much can I believe him really Um, but you, you it is really an exercise in just trying to get validation wherever you can uh to try and motivate yourself to get to keep going and and I I remember the moment I someone called me and said you know that the manuscript was shortlisted now I like I never win anything like not even the school raffle so to have kind of been shortlisted I was just like screaming on the inside and you know and that's a moment that like it was just such a relief to to know that like three judges read it and liked it Um, and so it is really um a, a real confidence, a real confidence boost to, to have that, to have that happen. Um, but, you know, yeah, like a, a lot of it is in your, is in your own head. It's a battle with yourself, you know, like you kind of oscillate between optimism and self-doubt um, and you're just going to have to kind of battle on <laughs> until you see the light. <laughs> Uh, Thank you, Annabelle and Lee. Um, We're going to mute you again. And we want to get through as many questions as we can from all of you who have joined. So we'll try and sort of, I don't want to shorten your answers Mm. at all, but we'll try and get through as many as we can. So Joy says, I wonder what Harriet would have made of the way Primrose was abused by her brother-in-law. So if Primrose had told Harriet about Terence, what do you think Harriet would have said? I feel like Harriet is a bit old fashioned in that perhaps she doesn't, she's one of those people that might not want to really mind other people's business. So I I think it's really hard to say what she might have done. I think she might have perhaps encouraged Primrose to say something, uh, 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 to say something about it, uh, to speak up about it. but it's very, yeah, like it's very hard to see Harriet as a meddler, like in in the in in the best sense possible. But it's it's yeah, it's very hard to sort of see her wedging herself into that situation. Okay. Um, other than, you know, perhaps kind of making Primrose do a few more drills so that she can snap out of it. Um, Maddie wants to know what was the inspiration for the cleaning obsession because it was quite confronting Mm. and also strangely relatable. And can Mm. I tell you a secret that when we met for coffee, I looked at your fingers. (laughs) They're much better now than before. Before, because I, but I, I wondered yeah, if you were a cleaner. Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, a cleaner as yes, in I am quite an rose. obsessive uh, cleaner, a bit of a clean freak. And one of the things w- that happens when you're living with someone who's recovering from cancer is that because they have no immunity, you have to be super hygienic with everything. And so I did myself go through a period where I was cleaning the house quite obsessively. 
not to the point that my hands were 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 bleeding or or anything like that. So it's sort of being slightly dramatized mm. in the in the book. You but, were doing um, it out of necessity out for of your necessity. husband who yes. was un- That's right. unwell. Yes. And yeah. you I have known many people uh that I've had met in the hospital, uh, family members who were doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, Kate says, I found the fact that the golf club was doomed to close, especially mm-hmm. compelling. So why did you decide that this would be the case? Yeah. So I, uh, so the real, the golf club in real life is called the Elstonwick Public Golf Course. And I went there in the winter of 2018. And as it turned out, it was a few weeks away from being closed down forever. And it had been there for over a hundred years, but it was closing. And one of the reasons I wanted to write about a golf course was actually because, I mean, it sounds weird now, but at the time I almost felt like the golf course was a bit of a friend <laughs> in the sense that uh, we were both kind of grappling with this question of mortality. Uh, and it was so sad and poignant that this, this thing is going to be no longer. And, um, and, and so, so that kind of triggered this uh, thing in the book where the golf course was, was also closing. And in fact, it's kind of a bit of a trend at the moment that a lot of golf courses yeah. are closing to make way for other things, for better or worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Marianne says, is her husband, Adrian, really having an affair? Because that's kind of vague as well, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Again, I'm open to all interpretations. <laughs> um, okay, Maria, but, but your call. <laughs> yeah, but um, but I, I, I think it's. I mean, in my mind, it was fairly certain, I suppose. Uh, but it's just that you know, Primrose is the one telling the story, and she's she's so muted sometimes as a storyteller that she's she's not like explicitly saying anything. Um, and so you know. She's she's kind of leaving it to the reader to interpret, um, and that you know, I think some people like that. Some maybe some people don't, but that's kind of <laughs> how her narrative evolved. Um, Nina, just sort of left field mm. slightly. People are loving your skirt. Oh. Can you give, can you give them a twirl? Can you stand up and show them what's what's the story? And you'll have to get down behind the microphone again to tell us the story. But so, there's the twirl. But here's the twirl. I, yeah. Say that this is the first twirl I have ever done for a camera in my entire life. Um, but yes, it's it's um it's from Gorman actually, but it's Gorman circa 2016 or something. I want to say so it's almost vintage. And you walked in. We both walked in and said, "Oh, we thought we were just going to be in front of like a laptop." I almost yeah. wore my tracksuit <laughs> pants, right? And you said, "Well, this is a summer skirt that I've just had yeah. sort of in the yeah, cupboard yeah, for yeah. ages." Yeah, that's right. Um, I I haven't bought any clothes for myself for ages, so I just yeah, it was like it was the brightest thing I could find, and I thought, "Well, I'm going to be on camera, so I might as well brighten myself up." So. Sam wants to know <laughs> how long did it take to write the novel? So the first draft took about a year. And it was a very chaotic year because it was the year of lockdown. And, uh, you know, I took uh, one thing I find really helpful when writing is taking hot showers. So I took a huge number of hot showers during that year. To, and I, I'm, I've been told that it's quite quick in terms of uh, how long it takes people generally. It's quite one year is quite quick. But then having said that, then it was another two years before the book got pu- published. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so it's a bit of a marathon. Um, the question you least want to hear, I'm about to ask you, <laughs> is there a second book? Is there a sequel? FK actually says, what about a sequel to yeah. this book? So, I, you know, I, it, I, as I said, it took three years for the book to be published. So I feel like, you know, Primrose and Peter may need a break from me. Like I've been hovering over them for three years trying to, work things out I think it's time they maybe do walk off into the sunset <laughs> and try to figure it out for themselves it's like having your children growing up and leave home you know it's just you're on your own now so I mean like I I think maybe further down the track mm-hmm. there could be we could come back and and revisit but right now I think it, I think it's been mutually agreed that maybe you know we can okay. take a little bit of a break um, now, I said Terence was the one character we could all agree on that we didn't mm. like. Um, FK actually has asked that they want to know more about him. He's such a nasty character. Um, why is he the way he is? 
Um, well, I think he personified. So I've worked a lot in, you know, financial journalism, in, in finance, in fact, and I feel like he, um, I've met lots of people who kind of slightly resemble Terence, not to the extent of doing what he did, but, um, you know, there's something that, happens to people when they are given money and power and it's not always pretty and so I think Terence is someone like that that um, because he is given uh, you know because he has the world at his feet mm. that he continues to think that he has and that he can ask for more I think that's a very kind of realistic portrayal of um, uh, uh, I think a lot of people in positions of power. <laughs> so do you, um, Matty asked, did Louisa suspect or envy Primrose's connection to Peter and therefore that scene on the cliff edge? Yeah, I mean, Louisa is not, in many ways, not a very likeable character, but you can sort of empathise with her in a way because she is married to Peter and uh, maybe there is this sort of, natural possessiveness that comes out of that so so a lot of her manipulation is driven maybe by this desire to keep her husband like I said before you know like the, every character in this book is uh f flawed but also you know have aspects that you can empathize uh with so you can sort of see maybe why she's doing what she's doing is to keep him Mm. Yeah. Um, oh, the question just disappeared then. Well, if it, but yeah, mm. Samantha says, does the finality of the closure of whistles mean that Primrose and Peter have to make a choice, that they can't have the opportunity to rethink the albatross again? I mean, again, I think it's open to interpretation, but in some ways, you know, uh, I think some people would take from the book that maybe the albatross didn't matter in the end, you know, mm. and maybe the golf course didn't matter in the end. Like Harriet says to Primrose, she tells her that story about the guy who gets hit by a bus and, you know, people go, oh, you know, like, was it the golf course that, mm. you know, kept you going? And he goes, no, just, you know, just look out, dot, for, buses. Look out for buses, Yeah, you know. And great so, line. so I think Primrose spends most of her time maybe perhaps thinking that there, there was something on that golf course about that albatross that could help her figure things out. But, but, but in fact, um, the answers are um, in life itself, not, not uh, constrained to a golf course. Um, mm. Tracy says, we need a book where Harriet undertakes guerrilla warfare to keep the golf course open. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, there's a, it's not a big story, part of the story, but Josh, the uh, golf course attendant, he, he did actually try, give a, give a pretty good go at trying to keep the golf course. Uh, but, yeah, no, I can see some sort of spin-off perhaps happening where, like, maybe <laughs> Harriet teams up with Josh <laughs> to yeah. do that, to well, make that happen. Um, someone, uh, Samantha says the next book can be called Eagle. You can. There's a lot of birds yeah, out there. There's yeah, a lot or, of. <laughs> yes, or as. And golf uh, shots. Yes, and or as my, uh, my kids suggested, I could just call it the Albatross Returns. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jack says, I'm interested in why keep the illness from Bebe? Is that how you? Bebe. Bebe. Yes. Um, I think it's a natural thing for some parents to want to kind of keep their children away from the horrors of the illness. Um, Bebe is very young, you know, she's six. And so when Adrian began to be six, she was probably like about five. So, uh, so I think it's kind of understandable that they might want to keep that, but also maybe perhaps in, in keeping that from her, it's almost like not having to acknowledge it uh, within the household, not just, just maybe pretending that it didn't exist at all. Mm. Uh, and in fact, Primrose and Adrian don't really talk about it in very explicit ways themselves. It's like they, they are each trying to deal with it in their own ways, but they're not doing it together. So that then goes to FM's question, which is, was Primrose ever happy in her marriage? Because it seems like she never really loved Adrian. I, th 
she sort of loved Adrian. <laughs> you know, there's that flashback chapter when she was 26 and Adrian saying, oh, you know, why don't you apply for this job at the newspaper? And, you know, and there is a bit of um, lovey-dovey there, I, I, you know, I think. And, he, and Adrian's quite sweet and he's quite supportive. Um, but you do get the sense that perhaps Primrose always kind of carried this memory of Peter in 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 her head so that even when she was with Adrian mm-hmm. that perhaps she was she never really forgot Peter and in fact at the end of that chapter you know she was like don't invite Peter to this Christmas party <laughs> because you know I don't want to go there again sort yeah. of thing so yeah um Beck says was it easy or difficult to write Peter's obnoxious rich friends it was quite easy. Like the character of Lawrence in particular was really a joy to write. <laughs> like, you know, he kind of. Um, remind people about Lawrence. Yeah. So Lawrence is the obnoxious friend at the dinner uh, when they all go away to the house in Flinders and, you know, Lawrence drives around in a, a big show off uh, Range Rover, you know, it, like. Yeah, like I, I feel like in some in some ways Lawrence is a bit caricature almost, mm. but um, he sort of vaguely reminds you of certain people that you might have like met, you know, in life too. So, um, yeah, Lawrence is kind of almost like like a a, a funny and alarming character. Like he's kind of both at the same time. Um, Annabelle says the great difference between Primrose and Terence, and I don't think this is um, Crab, it's another Annabelle, oh. is that Primrose is always assessing the environment around her. Terence is always evaluating his own opportunities and what he can get away with. So is this something you felt like you observed in journalism? Yeah, I think this goes back to my point before in that because I was covering um, the corporate sector and I was writing about the share market you know you just you you see the worst of human emotions in that context the the kind of the greed and the sort of um um selfishness and um the the hunger for power and so on and so yeah so I think that's probably what led to Terence being the character that he is Mm. yeah Okay. Um, Belinda says, well, would Primrose have let BB leave for America if she was in a similar situation? Because this was all about Primrose not going to meet Peter yeah. in the US. What do you think? Yeah. I love this. Like you're almost I, building on these characters I, as we're sitting here. It's <laughs> awesome. I love it. So I feel like Primrose actually did not not go to America because her parents wouldn't let her. Because, okay. in fact, she didn't, I don't think she ever really even asked them if she could go. Yeah. Primrose did not go because she didn't feel like, almost like she was worthy mm. of his love in some way. You know, she had that awful friend who kept telling her, you know, oh, he'll never come back. It was yeah. just a momentary thing. And so I think that's what led her not to go to America. Um, but when I, if I was to think about my own daughter, if she was 18 and I, and she wanted to go to America, I probably would let her go. Mm. Yeah. And um, I'd probably, and if she was going for a boy, I'd probably have heavily, heavily researched the boy first before I said yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, but yeah, I could, I could kind of see that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kate says, do you write by the seat of your pants? <laughs> do you know where the story's going? No. Well, you've already said that you wanted to start it with a golf club and hopefully end it with the golf club, yeah. with the course. Yeah. So uh, so I have like an inkling of roughly what the picture might look like, but I don't plan out chapters and I don't, um, and, and I, I sometimes I go back to the drawing board a lot. So I do a lot of typing and then I do a lot of deleting as well mm. and I, I I get writer's block a lot and what do you and, do you know, to get over that because people yeah. are often fascinated yeah. so, with the actual process yeah. so two things um the hot showers I think which I mentioned already and I'm, I'm not, talk- not talking about like a comfortable warm shower I mean like a scolding hot shower where you walk out looking like a boiled lobster or something you know there's just something about the hot water that I think lubricates the mind so a lot of my ideas come from that in fact the character of Peter came to me while I was in the shower um 
And the other thing I do, which is a bit strange, and I don't think I've actually ever told anyone is like, sometimes when I get really stuck, I, I start to talk to myself in um, an Irish accent. Uh, and like, I don't, I, yeah, what? I, I don't know what? why, but like, I, you know, there's something really lyrical and songful about an Irish accent. What, what does it sound like? Oh, don't, when, please don't make oh, me come do on. it. <laughs> come on, no, Nina. No, you, you started that. Is, I'm it sorry. It very much better. Like, it basically just involves rolling all your ass, basically, because that's the best that, that I can do. But there's something about, like, I don't know, that that accent that um, it's kind of, it puts a kind of music in your head. And then you kind of, so you get, you start to get this kind of rhythm and then you just kind of have to fill in the words. <laughs> so, you know, the, so there are a lot of passages in the book that were written, um, you know, with an Irish accent, I think. <laughs> um, it didn't sort of, we didn't make the audiobook person do it that way. But, um, but yeah, but that, that actually really helped. And I, I mean, I don't know, maybe people, you know, you can try other types of accents <laughs> what what does some um, um shell griffin ask what does a day in your writing life look like um so when i wrote the albatross it was like five minutes here and there in between all the other things that i had to do because you know the kids were home being homeschooled at the time and the husband was home and there was a dog and a rabbit uh, and so you know it was literally just kind of um yeah, just sort of stealing a bit of time away to the laptop and just typing something down. But then like later at night, you know, I'd sort of sit down and do maybe longer spurts once everyone's asleep. But that, So it's a very chaotic uh, way of writing and I probably wouldn't recommend it. No, FK but, just went, what? You did yeah. it while homeschooling? You did yeah. it during COVID? Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, sometimes people say if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Yeah. And that probably rang true for me that year when I was just um, almost maybe like looking for a bit of an escape. Um, Sam says, I enjoyed all the music references. Do you still play the piano? Yeah, I, I do play the piano, actually. <laughs> uh, so when I was younger, uh, because I was classically trained, I used to play a lot of um, Beethoven and Bach and stuff like that uh, but but now I because I just play for pleasure I just play like songs from movies and things like that which I find much more enjoyable and much less heavy going yeah so yeah oh. <laughs> um what's next for Nina is the question from Sam um I am working on a second book but it's very very early so it's kind of like I, I can't even tell you what it's about because it's uh, it's just like a jumble of ideas in my head. But I definitely would love to um, keep the momentum going with the writing. But having uh, said that, you know, being a writer is kind of like having a double life in some ways. So, you know, there's my other life, which I have to get on with as well, which is, you know, I, I do have a day job. I work as a gov government advisor, which has nothing to do with writing, you know. So um, so it's kind of about just always balancing the two lives that you want to lead simultaneously. I mean, this has been such a whirlwind for you. It mm. must have been mm. surreal at yeah. times. Yes. Are there moments where you've wanted to pinch yourself Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, so the book was published at the end of April and then I did the Melbourne Writers Festival straight away. And so I was, you know, at parties with um, people who like literary celebrities, basically, you know, book prize winners and so on. So it was very like surreal and I had to pinch myself. What was a lot going of times. through your mind? What, what did you tell yourself when you walked into that room? Did you say, I belong here or? Uh, no, it was more like, can, should I go and talk to these people? <laughs> I think was what was going through my mind. And there is now a famous story of me, um, you know, giving uh, Bill Hayes, the author of Insomniac City, a hug at um, a cocktail party because I thought he was coming over to talk to me when he was just <laughs> heading, you know, for the bathroom. So it was... 
So, yeah, so those were those kinds of things that were going through my head, unfortunately, you know, like, is Bill Hayes coming to talk to me? Should I talk to him? Uh, yeah. I'll just hug him instead. Yeah, I'll just hug him instead. Oops. He was going to the bathroom. Yeah. yeah, oh, no, he was very he was very nice about it. He was very subtle um, as he walked to the bathroom. <laughs> we've probably got time for one more question, I think. So from Tonya, I listened to your book on Audible. Mm. Do you get to choose the person who reads your audio book? And what are you looking for in a voice? This is interesting. You yeah. didn't want to do it? Uh, they didn't ask me. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, and I, I don't think I could have done it as well as her. So it's a mm. girl called Lin Yin. And I actually did sort of get to choose her in the sense that they gave me three voices. Uh, and they, were, they all read a passage, the same passage from the book. And they said, you know, which one uh, do you like? And... Um, Lynn's voice um, just really, really grabbed me from the get go. Uh, and I, up until then, I actually did not know what Primrose would sound like. I felt like maybe she sounded a bit like me, you know, but, um, but Lynn had the right voice, the right articulation. Uh, and she's, she's actually an actor as well. So, you know, you can see that she's sort of like, been theatrically trained to do it so 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 yeah so we're very very happy with the audiobook and the way it turned out oh uh, well I've, I've now so I've read your book twice now I'm clearly going to have to listen to it <laughs> the audiobook as well um look we called this the inaugural uh chat 10 book club but actually it's the what the heck I need to be home in bed book club <laughs> so we are going to have to call it a day Love to get your feedback on how you felt about tonight because if you liked it, we might try and do more. Um, I'm going to throw back to Lee Sales in a moment and, Nina, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming. I've loved meeting you and I've loved having the I chat. I have too and thank you for having me and I just want to say to all the readers out there, uh, you know, it means the world to an author to have her book read and sort of dissected and so this is um it's a great feeling and a great honor terrific salzy back to you is salzy unmuted no can you unmute yourself salzy <laughs> Oops, not hearing Salzy. Oh, it was going so well. Hang on. No, still don't go anywhere. It this is what happens. I knew it. Chat 10. <laughs> we thought we could get through an hour <laughs> no, successfully. I'm unmuted. <laughs> It was saying the host needed to unmute me, so that's what was going on there. Um, I just want to say thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. We'll we'll sort of tick tack and think about if we're going to do this again. Um, I I just felt terrible for Gwenny when that video at the start that I know she put so much work in that we lost the audio um, with that, and honestly, she's gone to so much effort with that. So I just wanted to see. Um, if we're able to re-roll it, um, if they've got the audio sorted out. So Zanon, who's running things, I'm going to see if he can hit play on that again for everybody. Hi, I'm Gwen Blake, and today I'm hoping that I'm going to be a very smug boat. I'm going to show you how to make a bunt in the Thermomix. The Thermomix is an absolutely awesome kitchen machine and it's one of the favorite things that I have in my life because it is all about efficiency. Um, so the first step that I'm gonna do in order to make a bunt is I'm gonna search for bunt on this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Well, we tried. We're still here, thankfully. But I know, Salesy, you also wanted to say something about what's happening in Sydney. So can we go back to Salesy? Okay, can you hear me now? The host needs to unmute me. So am I unmuted? You are, girlfriend. Let Excellent. Good. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the Sydney live show is coming up on this Saturday week. Um, and it's going to be an incredible show. We've got, we're flying Kirk Hamilton out, the host of Strong Songs from the States. Um, and we're only doing one show in Sydney. We normally do two. So it's just gigantically oversubscribed. And so there is a live stream of the Sydney show. I've seen the video um, that Kirk's presenting and the song, and it's just absolutely so fantastic. So if you want to join the live stream, you can have a look on, just look at the Facebook group, go to our Chat 10 uh, Looks 3 website, just Google Chat 10 Looks 3, go to the website, have a look at events and it'll have the details of the live stream. You can check it on our Instagram account, but there will be a live stream. So you'll be able to tune in if you're not in Sydney or if you couldn't get tickets or whatever, and you'll be able to watch that. Um, and can I just say thank you to Lisa, especially because she has to get up at 3am to go and host breakfast. You've done a fantastic job as we knew you would. And thank you, Nina, too. Hey, can we thank unmute um, Annabelle as well? So uh, she can have a little hello, goodbye. Unmuted. You have, Dal, you have. It's, the floor totally, is yours. I've totally horned in on this and um, uh, uh, as an unscheduled series of remarks, I'll keep them brief. Um, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed this like slightly shambolic production kind of uh, enterprise, which is absolutely on brand at Chat 10 Looks 3. Thank you, Nina, and thank you, Lisa, for this beautiful conversation. And I would encourage you all to just... Um, stream the Sydney show because there's some other great stuff coming including a guest appearance by Jennifer Wong um, who's going to be extremely of interest to our uh, to our community on Chat 10 Looks 3. Thank you for a beautiful conversation tonight and it's been so amazing to see all of your faces and um, it'd be great if we can do this again. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. We'll say a final goodbye. I'm going to take a little photo and a video of this setup and I'll put it on the Facebook page so you can see what we were looking at when we were looking at you. Thank you, everyone. Sleep well. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.